My shirt is so loud today. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Tribe. Crew Tribe. Crew Tribe. Crew Tribe. If you are new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, turn on all the little notifications, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. So today's story was not necessarily recommended. Actually, it probably has been recommended a bunch of times. <laughs> Today's story is one that I hadn't really thought about covering because I feel like everyone knows this story, like everyone. It has popped up in the news recently, again, for reasons that we'll get into later. So I thought it would be, you know, why not? Why not cover it? This is the story of Yolanda Saldivar. Oh my gosh, look at this white hair. Do you guys see this white hair? Like, holy moly, you gotta go. Oh, by the way, I don't really talk about the makeup that I'm using as I'm using it. This is new, by the way. But if you want to know what it is, just look down in the description box because everything is linked. Selena Quintanilla Perez, best known simply as Selena or Salinas. Anything for Salinas. She was the queen of Tejano music, a truly gifted Mexican-American singer. She broke barriers in the world of music in the 1990s. Billboard Latin Music Award winner, Tejano Music Award winner, Grammy Award winner. She elevated Latin pop to the mainstream market, selling out arenas everywhere she went. She was also quite a fashionista. She had a signature playful style that was sexy yet wholesome and family friendly. And she opened up a chain of fashion boutiques in Texas, appointing her former fan club president and friend Yolanda Saldivar as the, the manager. Selena was a very down to earth, kind hearted young woman right on the edge of becoming a household name, not only in Latin communities, but like everywhere across the world. And you know you're hot shit when you're like, one name famous. Anything for Salina. <laughs> so how did she end up dying on the floor of a days in motel lobby of a gunshot wound at the age of 23? And why was her friend Yolanda the one holding the gun? Well, hold on to your butts and I'll tell you. So we need to start at the beginning. Spring of 1971 was a happy time for the Quintanilla family in Lake Jackson, Texas. Marcella was pregnant with her third child with husband Abraham Sr. Their son Abraham Jr. or AB was seven years old. They also had another daughter named Suzette or Susie that was three years old. The Quintanilla family was happily expecting a baby boy who they intended on naming Mark Anthony. Surprise, when the baby arrived on Sunday, April 16th, it was a girl. Marcella named the baby Selena. Abraham Sr., Selena's father, had always had music in his soul. During the 1960s, while living in Corpus Christi, Texas, he led a band called Los Dinos. It means the guys. They were locally successful, but they ended up disbanding around 1974 to grow up you know, and support their families. Abraham got a job with Dow Chemical, but he was miserable. So fast forward to one afternoon, Abraham was teaching 13 year old AB to play the guitar and six year old Selena was starting to sing along to the melody and he noticed that she could sing. <laughs> He immediately got an idea and Selena y Los Dinos was born. That means Selena and the guys. I already told you what Los Dinos means. <laughs> So this new band of kids specialized in a very specific type of music called Tejano. I'm gonna try my best for these pronunciations today. I'm really trying, but don't roast me, okay? Tejano is a Texas-born genre of classic Mexican rhythms, a mix of cumbias and country western and R&B. A little bit of pop in there too. Abraham went to work right away soundproofing the family's garage so that they could rehearse and he was just working overtime on growing the budding talents of all of the kids with hopes of catapulting them into stardom one day. It was very much like Jackson family vibes without all the trauma. <laughs> 
As they entered the 1980s, the Quintanilla family was impacted, like most Americans, by the recession. Abraham didn't have that job at Dow Chemical anymore. He was actually running a restaurant, and it wasn't working out. He declared bankruptcy, and they ended up losing their home there in Lake Jackson, and they had to move back to Corpus Christi with family. Now, Abraham was relentless. You know, he was a very hard worker, but he also had faith in the talent of his children. He knew that they had it. He also knew that there was quite a market for Tejano music in the area, and they could take it by storm. Selena learned to speak Spanish phonetically so she could perform the songs, and by eighth grade, she was out of traditional school and on the road full-time pursuing music with the family band. I mean, all the kids were out of school. I mean, they were like being homeschooled. You get it. Selena and her siblings finished school by correspondence, and Selena graduated at age 17. Music was certainly the priority, and the band was making some serious waves in the Tejano scene. Selena started racking up awards, taking home Female Vocalist of the Year at the Tejano Music Awards for the next 11 years in a row. Really kind of like fast forwarding through like the story of the band and their rise to success, like really skimming over the details. Well, after the 1989 performance at the Tejano Music Awards and three years after officially bursting onto the scene, record labels were like fighting over themselves to sign Selena. One of the labels, EMI, was actually a offshoot of another company focused on more Latin music, but because it was an offshoot of an American company, Abraham was looking into the future, right? He knew that their goal was eventually to cross over to the English market, so the best way to get there was to sign with EMI. English like English speaking, not like English. It was also around this time that the band decided to switch up the marketing and they decided to drop Elos Dinos, even though they were very much still together one band. And instead, they adopted the single name Selena. Selena with an S. So when I'm talking about the musical stuff and I say Selena did this, Selena did that, I really mean like the band. Selena dropped the self-titled album Selena in October of 1989. AB, the brother, became Selena's principal record producer and songwriter for most of the career. Selena peaked at number seven on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Artist Chart, becoming Selena's first debut on a national chart. Later that year, Selena's brother A.B. was tasked with finding a replacement guitarist for their band, and he found Chris Perez. He was performing with another band at a concert hall one night, and Chris had major bad boy rocker vibes. Abraham was squinting. <laughs> he did not want that in his band at all, but his skills were undeniable so he was hired and Selena was smitten immediately but we'll come back to that. The 1990s were huge for Selena. She was everywhere. She was the face of Coca-Cola for Texas. She was doing ads for kids to stay in school. A young Beyonce actually met her at a Texas mall and even as a child she felt the warmth and charm that Selena exuded. I just saw her and said hello and, and kept it moving. Selena released her second studio album in 1990 called Ven Conmigo, which means come with me. This would skyrocket Selena and her popularity was growing by leaps and bounds in Mexico. Okay, so that officially brings us to the 90s. So Selena y Los Dinos are totally established with EMI Latin records. They're on fire. And that brings us to Yolanda Saldivar. Yolanda was a 30-year-old registered nurse who lived in San Antonio, Texas. She was, of course, a fan of Selena, so much so that she started a fan club after seeing Selena in concert. Yolanda had actually reached out personally to Abraham Quintanilla and convinced him to legitimize the club as official. He didn't know Yolanda personally, but she seemed very sincere and dedicated, and Yolanda was in. She pretty soon became very close with the Quintanilla family and later became a confidant to none other than Selena herself. Yolanda was a stan among stans. In these days, the term stan just 
It just means big fan. Probably somebody who goes to a lot of concerts, buys the merch, knows a lot about the artist and the music and all that, but like not necessarily dangerous. But shall I remind everyone, the term Stan, it comes from that song by Eminem in which a fictional obsessive fan named Stan, because of course it rhymes. So this Stan person acts out violently as a means to try to impress Eminem and like get close to him. Well, Yolanda was a Stan, like a legit for real Stan, but the Quintanillas didn't know that at first. How could they? She just seemed very dedicated. In 1991, she quit her job as a nurse so that she could manage the fan club full time. The club was growing very quickly and she was doing a good job. Now that same year, Selena recorded a duet with Latin singer Alvaro Torres. The song was called Buenos Amigos. It was a huge hit, shooting to number one on the US Billboard Latin charts. And suddenly the radio stations that had previously passed on playing Selena's music were now featuring her pretty heavily. In 1992, the flirtation between Selena and the new guitar player, Chris Perez, I mean, it wasn't new anymore by this point, but the flirtation got kind of serious. On the morning of April 2nd, 1992, the two lovebirds flew off to the courthouse and got married. <laughs> it was quite the drama with Selena's dad but he got over it and it ended up being kind of a good thing. You know, Selena grew up. A month later, Selena released her third studio album, Entre a Mi Mundo. Let me say that again. <laughs> Entre a Mi Mundo. Huh? Hmm? Huh? It means enter my world. The album was of course a hit. It was also record breaking for Tejano music and it became the second best selling regional Mexican album of all time. Selena's next album was live and it was recorded on February 7th, 1993 during a free concert in Corpus Christi at the Memorial Coliseum. Live was nominated and won the Grammy in 1993 for best Mexican American album. The Grammy Awards was one of the best nights of Selena's life up to that point. It also gave her the opportunity to reach the fan base for a crossover album. Later that year, on September 12th, 1993, Selena's sister Susie Suzette got married to her beau of two years, Bill, and interestingly, Yolanda was a bridesmaid. The Quintanillas really liked her. You know, they often hosted her for dinner in their home and they were just close. 1994 was a season of change for Selena. You know, she was about to break through to mainstream pop music. She was happily married, but she was ready for something new. Selena had always been like fashionista. She designed a lot of her onstage costumes and even styled the band. So she turned her passion for fashion <laughs> into a clothing line and a series of boutiques in Texas. She opened Selena Etc. in Corpus Christi and in San Antonio, both equipped with in-house beauty parlors, hair and makeup. Selena's dream was to have a store that had it all, you know, a place that you could get your hair and makeup done and buy an outfit and just leave a new woman. So the Quintanilla family was impressed with and close to Yolanda at this point, And they had asked her that in addition to her fan club duties, that she could manage Selena's boutiques. And of course, Yolanda was in. Eight months later, Selena appointed Yolanda as her registered agent in San Antonio and then later in Corpus Christi. By the end of 1994, Selena's boutiques had pulled in $5 million and she was ready to release her fourth studio album called Amor Prohi Prohibido. Amor Prohibido. Stop it. Which is arguably her best. Media outlets considered Selena to be bigger than Tejano itself. Finally, EMI was ready to help her develop her crossover album as a pop solo artist. She began working with Grammy award winning writers and producers on the English language album. She also performed a sold out concert at the Houston Astrodome. It's the one where she's wearing that iconic purple jumpsuit. You know the one, you've seen it. We're approaching superstardom at this point. But in December of 1994, troubles at the boutiques started to brew. Yolanda was the manager, remember, and she was constantly bumping heads with the staff. Like if she didn't like somebody, she would just fire them. So the boutiques were constantly understaffed 
and it started to really impact the business. She was also very vindictive and possessive of Selena, never allowing anybody to speak to her directly. So the employees, as best they could, would complain about Yolanda to Selena when able. Well, Selena just swatted these things away, never believing that her friend, Yolanda, could do something to betray her trust in, in any way. Eventually, the employees moved their complaints over to Abraham, who took things very seriously. He advised Selena to be careful. Yolanda might not be a good influence. Selena brushed him off knowing that Abraham was generally distrusting of most people. But Selena knew Yolanda. They were friends and friends don't hurt friends. So by January of 1995, Selena's cousin Deborah Ramirez, her fashion designer Martin Gomez, and clients were fed up with Yolanda's behavior and shitty management skills. Abraham had also started receiving phone calls from angry fans who had paid their $22 annual membership fee, but then they never received their t-shirts or CDs or photos or anything that they were promised. In the end, Abraham realized that Yolanda Saldivar had been embezzling money to the tune of almost $200,000 from both the fan club and the boutiques. On March 9th, 1995, Abraham called a meeting with Suzette, Selena, and Yolanda at their production offices, where he angrily confronted Yolanda, fired her on the spot, and threatened to involve local police unless she provided evidence that disputed his claims, the embezzling. Well, she had nothing but the excuse that everybody else was out to get her, and Abraham demanded that she cease all contact with Selena. Well, Selena was stunned and heartbroken. She didn't want to lose her friend and she held out hope that it was a misunderstanding. You know, that she could believe Yolanda. We now know that on March 13th, 1995, so shortly after this meeting, Yolanda purchased a 38 caliber snub-nosed pistol from a gun dealer in San Antonio. In late March, Selena started pressing Yolanda to return financial documents relating to the fan club and the boutiques. Yolanda had gone on some kind of travel to scout locations for boutiques in Mexico and had taken financial documents with her. And Selena needed those documents so that she could like file taxes and stuff. I'm doing stuff, Lori. Thanks. Yolanda was stalling and she told Selena that she had been sexually assaulted while she was in Mexico on this scouting trip. So on the morning of March 31st, 1995, Selena took Yolanda to the hospital in Corpus Christi. They went to the emergency room for her to get checked out. Yolanda was later referred out for a further exam in San Antonio because of some kind of jurisdiction issue. After that, Selena took Yolanda back to where she was staying, room 158 at the Days Inn in Corpus Christi. Selena again asked for the rest of the financial documents and Yolanda refused. They got into an argument and at 11.48 a.m., Yolanda reached into her handbag and pulled out a gun. Selena ran out of the room and Yolanda fired at her back. Selena ran for her life, leaving a long trail of blood from Yolanda's room to the motel lobby. She ran into the lobby breathless and desperate for help and then she collapsed on the floor. One of the motel housekeepers, Norma Martinez, heard the sound of the gunshot. She thought it was like a car backfiring. She saw with her own eyes Selena running away from the room yelling for help and Yolanda pointing a gun and chasing after her. She called Selena a bitch before she got into her pickup truck that was parked nearby. In the lobby, the desk clerk called 911 and before she lost consciousness, Selena was able to tell the clerk that she had been shot and to lock the door or she's gonna shoot me again. And her last words were Yolanda, room 158. When you listen to the 911 calls, the caller knows that Yolanda worked for the Selena Incorporated and she knows Selena like the singer but she had no idea that the person who had run in, shot, was the Selena. So Yolanda had fled to her pickup truck, but luckily it took emergency services like two minutes to arrive and that allowed police to kind of block her into the parking lot. And this was the start of a nine hour standoff with police. Yolanda was on the phone with them, completely breaking down, sobbing with negotiators as she held the gun to her own head. She only wanted to know Selena's condition before she was finally apprehended. 
apprehended. So Selena was unconscious and bleeding out and doctors worked on her for almost an hour before she was pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. on March 31st, 1995. The unbelievable news spread like wildfire. Selena's autopsy would later show that the bullet entered Selena's upper right back near her shoulder blade, passed through her chest cavity, severing a major artery, and then exited through her right upper chest. The next day, 3,000 fans gathered at a candlelight vigil at Bayfront Plaza in Corpus Christi. A public memorial was later held at the Bayfront Auditorium, drawing almost 60,000 grieving fans. At first, the crowd suspected that the closed coffin, surrounded by thousands of white roses, was empty, and that maybe she wasn't dead, it was some kind of publicity stunt. To calm them down, the family actually opened the casket for the viewing. Selena was laid to rest on April 3rd, 1995 in a private funeral attended mostly by close family and friends. Yolanda Saldivar was charged with first degree murder and was quickly indicted like three days later. She pled not guilty. <laughs> She claimed it was an accident, although she never formally confessed. While she was in that nine hour standoff with police, she repeatedly told police and the negotiators that the shooting was accidental. Could that have been the case? Maybe. Then why not try everything in your power to help your friend? Why run away? Why lock yourself in the car with a gun to your head for nine hours? The math ain't mathin'. She also claimed in that standoff that Abraham Quintanilla sexually assaulted her. Not true. She claimed that the shooting was Abraham's fault. Not true. It's all just like very bizarre and like nonsensical. Yolanda's trial happened very quickly, just a few months later in October of 1995. It was held in Houston, Texas. So the defense tried to explain that the gun fired accidentally, but the testimony from the witnesses that were there immediately following the shooting was, you know, more than enough to convict. After the jury deliberated for three hours, which is not a lot of time, Yolanda Saldivar was found guilty of first degree murder, and then she was later sentenced to life in prison with parole possible at 30 years, which was the maximum prison term allowed in Texas at that time. The crossover album that Selena was working on was released just a few short months after her death on July 18th, 1995. It was an immediate commercial success and became the first album that had been recorded mostly in Spanish to debut at number one on a US Billboard 200 chart. So basically, Selena walked so Bad Bunny could run. I'm Bad Bunny. Selena's impact on music and her memory lives on today. Countless memorials, foundations, tributes, books, albums, and art has been dedicated in honor of Selena, and her life story was featured in the iconic biopic Selena starring Jennifer Lopez, which rocket launched her career. Hot take, there would be no J-Lo without Selena. As for Yolanda, she is currently serving her sentence at the Patrick O'Daniel unit in Gatesville, Texas. And while this year makes the 29th year since Selena's death, it also signifies a big moment in Yolanda's, the ever closer possibility of freedom. Yolanda will become eligible for parole on March 30th, 2025. She has actually sat down for many prison interviews where she refuses to take accountability for the death of Selena. If there is this information that if it doesn't exonerate you at least gives context as to why Selena Quintanilla is dead, why would you not have demanded that that be presented in court to spare your life? If I knew then what I know now, you can rest assured that my trial wouldn't have gone the way it is. And uh, lately, she's been talking a lot. You might have seen some ads or some promotion recently about an upcoming two-part event called, quote, Selena and Yolanda, the secrets between them. I'll link it down in the description box so you can find it. It's supposed to come out next week sometime, or at least from the time that this video is gonna go up. So there have been many rumors over the years about Selena around the time of her death that she was pregnant at that time, she wasn't. Or that she and Yolanda were in some kind of romantic sexual relationship, they weren't. Or that Selena had gotten liposuction and then fell in love with the doctor, the plastic surgeon who did it, who was like older than her and was gonna run away with him. That's weird. Miss Yolanda now claims to have shared many secrets with Selena, and she's claiming that there is some kind of mysterious video in a bank in Mexico, and it's supposed to clear her name of all wrongdoing. Well then get it out, let's see it. Why, why, why are you still in prison then, Yolanda? Now, what's on the video you ask? It's a sex tape between Selena and this plastic surgeon, allegedly. Yolanda's sister has actually gone so far as to suggest that Yolanda 
did not fire the gun that day at all. She says that somebody else was hiding nearby and was actually theirs to kill Yolanda and Selena was killed on accident. Sure, Jan. Girl, the forensic evidence. Okay, it's already handled all of that, so please take several seats. Yolanda has filed endless appeals while in prison, grasping at the tiniest of tiny straws. She's actually been admonished by the courts for filing writs that were meritless. Either way, we're gonna see what happens when and if she applies for parole, won't we? So that, for now, is the story of Yolanda Saldivar. Again, if you want to know any of the makeup that I used in today's Luke, then just Luke down in the description box because I link everything. And if I used something that's not available anymore, I'll find you something similar. If you have a crew time story that you want to recommend to me, just look down in the description box. There is a link for a Google document where you can go to it, fill in the details. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all of the other socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! It is Super Bowl Sunday and I'm recording this and I need to hurry up to debate. Yolanda Salvi, Salvi, Salvi Bar. Entre a mi mundo. I tried. I'm trying. Selena P. Fuck. Andrea on on the floor. Fucking fuck. Andre Andre a mi mundo. An, Andre a mi mundo. Chris Chris company. That was folk. A B motherfucker. Andre a mi. Why can't I? Because I don't speak Spanish. That's why I can't say this. I tried.